This is Yuri Gagarin, April 12th, 1961. He becomes the first human being ever to leave planet Earth. He got there on the, you know, the pinnacle of technology of the time, the Vostok rocket. He launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And now we fast forward 55 years later when people like Butch Wilmore go to space. Nearly over half a century of space exploration. And how do we send literally every single person into space today? Well, we do it on none other than the Soyuz rocket. Uh, they almost look identical, right? And that's because they actually are, in many ways, identical. The Soyuz rocket came into operation only six years after Gagarin took his historical first flight into space. So, no matter what, if it's a, the Soyuz, the Vostok, even the space shuttle, they all use the exact same technology. It's chemical propulsion. And that's really the heart of the problem of how we've been doing space for the, the history of space, is that only 2% of that rocket is the thing that we want in space. The other 98% is the structure of the rocket, the fuel, the engines, and all the other stuff to get that 2% there because it takes a tremendous amount of energy to get off of the bottom of what we call Earth's gravity well, right? It's a huge amount of energy. The Apollo astronauts in this picture were traveling 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet to escape the gravitational pull of Earth. And anything we've ever sent beyond Earth's gravitational pull has had to travel that fast, 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet. Try to put that in perspective, it's really hard. So the supply chain to space is broken. And for everybody in this crowd who's manufacturing, it's easy to think about supply chains and how 3D printing can disrupt them. But to us, that was, the, that was kind of the big idea, is that the supply chain to space is broken. It's, you know, the rocket problem has existed this whole time. We, the supply chain means we put rockets on barges and ship them across oceans. Some rockets even have to get on to a, fit on a train track to get to the launch pad. That means that the width of a rocket is determined by the width of a train track. And since the size of anything we've ever put into space has, has, has to fit into a rocket, that means the size of the things in space are determined by the width of a train track. Um, just imagine the things that we've never been able to do just because of that one fact. So the cost then becomes a big problem. One liter of water in low Earth orbit costs $10,000. It's $10,000 a kilogram to put things into space at today's launch cost. So when we started Made in Space, we recognized that a lot of people have been trying to solve this problem. They've been looking at how to make better, faster, cheaper. We've seen a lot of reusable rockets now. But we asked a fundamentally different question. We challenged the status quo. We said, what if one day everything in space could be made in space? What if, in fact, you didn't need to launch anything at all? So what would that look like? What if we didn't have to launch anything at all? Well, first off, the satellites that we put in space would be far larger than what you can fit into a rocket. Imagine communication satellites that are essentially just gigantic antennas the size of a football stadium with microelectronics built into the structure that could provide global broadband internet to the entire planet. Or gigantic truss elements that could support future space station designs or shared platforms in space for international users. So this is actually what Made in Space is working on. We have printers on the space station that's a it's a service and it's a product that we provide, but all of that technology is building towards the ability to do this, and we're working with NASA and industry partners to actually do this right now. We're under contract, and in the next few years, we'll start to make some real missions happen.